time. We only have one hour. And what we did with questions is, um, if you remember, Tony sent out an email asking for questions to be submitted to him. And we have about 10 questions. We'll endeavour to get through as many of them as possible. And they have been um, ordered in such a manner so that they flow from one to the other. Um, I will occasionally interrupt. What I will mostly be asking the candidates to do is to, is to keep the answers brief because we are short of time. Um, we won't be um, having questions from the floor uh, as a general rule, um, but these um, candidates will all be having a coffee afterwards and you're welcome to ask them any question at the, at the end uh, when, uh, when you have that opportunity to do so. Let me just start with a question for everyone here. Kerry, why don't you take a seat here? Um, uh, who has not made up their mind who they're going to vote for yet on the 7th of May? <laughs> okay, I will ask that question again at the end, just to see um, how effective this session has been. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give each candidate one minute to introduce themselves and say very briefly why they're standing. Um, and then we will start running through the questions um, and uh, we'll uh, see how it goes from there. So I'd like to start on my right with the current member of Parliament for St Albans uh, and May. We do need a microphone, so the three people to my right and to your left, please pass this microphone between you and Sandy's got that one that's on the wire. Thank you, can you hear me? Um, I thought it was quite good to look at what I said the last time I stood, which was in uh, 2005. Oh, sorry, no. There's a red light on, so it should be on. Okay? Next. No, no, no. Is there a mute button? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> if not, I'll shout. That's better. Uh, yes, oh, thank you. I just thought it would be quite useful, apart from the glasses, to see what I said the last time I was trying to stand, and to see if I would varied from it. And I actually said, I'll work for a better, safer future for all the families, and like you, I want to be part of a society that isn't great at the expense of other people in society, that values diversity, good education, law, order and justice, but importantly a society that believes in responsibilities as well as rights. And too often people want to change but don't want to work, bring it about, and it's easy to sit on the fence and abstain and leave decision making to someone else. Well, I believe my record shows that I've actually carried out those beliefs, that I am keen to support the whole of St Albans, regardless of your political persuasion, and my office has been made very available to lots of people, over 22,000 people. And I like to think we've given them a good service, whatever it is that's affected their families. And I don't believe in climbing onto this top of this greasy pole by bashing other people. So I, I always put out a positive vision of why you should vote for me as your energetic uh, Member of Parliament who will speak up for you. I don't want to be rubbing other people's noses in the dirt so you feel that, oh, don't vote for that candidate. I want you to vote for me positively. Uh, Jack Easton from the Green Party. Uh, good morning, my name is Jack Easton from the Green Party. Um, I am a very non tree hugging person. Uh, I was a mathematician at the furthest level of my education. I've been a chartered accountant in all my life. I work, I'm, I'm not a politician. I hope that pictures a very rational and sensible background for you. But I'm here because. The Green Party alone offers a vision of the essential way forward. Unless we put sustainability first, we're in deep, deep trouble. And I am here to give you the opportunity to vote for a sustainable future and for a caring and compassionate society. Thank you, Jack. Harry Park, the Green Party. Uh, good morning. Uh, very good to be here. I've come here many times uh, to uh, the Open Door Night Shows where we have our meetings here. Um, I was the uh, MP for St. from 97 to 2000. I'm very proud to do that. I think you have a, a reasonable service. Um, I've also done 35 years uh, continuous service for my community. I've lived in my house in Cottonwood for most of my life. All my family have uh, brought it. One of my proudest, uh, my one of my proudest uh, achievements is starting the Open Door Night Shelter, which I did 21 years ago, and I'm still involved today, and that has definitely saved lives. And I want to continue doing that and doing more. There are big decisions for us to make on health and housing uh, in, in the immediate future, and certainly uh, a, a heritage for our young people. We must guard that and pass on something that's better than it is now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kerry. 
and um, Sandy Walton from Liberal Democrats. Thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to be in this fantastic um, church. Um, I, looking around the room, I've probably met most of you over the last 35 years in the course of door knocking. I've only ever stood for public office in St Albans, sadly, with um, somewhat mixed um, results. Although I am currently the county councillor for the St Albans South Division and environment spokesperson, um, opposition environment spokesperson on Hertfordshire County Council, and formerly. I was district councillor for the Central St. Peter's Division in um, the city. Um, I'm married to an architect, Francesca, who amongst other things builds churches, and she's currently got a new church on site in Hemel Hempstead. And we have three more or less grown up children. In terms of my working background, I share with um, Justin Welby 11 years of working in the oil industry he went on to greater things. I went on to work in telecommunications and then public transport, um, transport um, for London. Um, and yes, um, I will stop there because I'm being paused. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so let's go on with the questions. As I said, these have been submitted in advance. I know some of you in Altani with them. So the first question, uh, I'll read out the whole question and then uh, we can uh, uh, go from one candidate uh, to the other. How does your party propose to address the growing gap? between the rich and the poor in society. There is evidence that the greatest levels of happiness and well-being are where the gap is the, is where the, gap is the smallest. The gap in the UK has been increasing rapidly. Um, Jack, please pick up the microphone and uh, pass it on when you're finished, and please say how the Green Party plan to address this issue of inequality. Wow, uh, on first. Um, I think the most important point to make is where is your vision and then how do you get there? And uh, our 2010 manifesto quoted extensively from the spirit level, which was the epidemiological study that showed how much health and well-being were affected by inequality. At a very um, sophisticated level, we have a concept called the citizen's income, which is intended to ensure that nobody should go without their basic wants and needs satisfied. That is a concept which doesn't involve any qualifications whatsoever. It's pure, straight compassion. To get there is a long way through a lot of um, steps. We have to start from today. We need affordable housing. We need rent controls. We need a living wage. We don't need zero hours contracts. We actually have a vision of a maximum wage legislation. To get there, you need to think about public reporting of highest pay, multiples, and scaling down uh, the differences that are paid. You also need, in the end, to recognise that vast pay and vast wealth comes from power and size. And unless you reduce the size and scale of international corporations and very large organisations, they will always have the power and the money to make the rich richer. Thank you very much. Sandy? Um, the Liberal Democrats have been in coalition um, and <coughs> the person who put that question certainly seems to think that the gap between the rich and the poor has been increasing. What's the Liberal Democrats' response to that? Well, first of all, I totally agree with the analysis that this question implies. But there are two issues here. One is income inequality, and the other is wealth inequality. Now, I spent my life as a young man fighting Mrs. Thatcher, but actually one of the achievements of the coalition government is that we have brought levels of post-tax income inequality back to where it was under Mrs. Thatcher. And shockingly, under John Major, under Tony Blair, under Gordon Brown, income inequality was greater in this country because people were taxed more at the bottom and taxed less at the top. However, the problem has been that during that past period of income inequality, people at the top with the highest incomes acquired assets. And that is what is driving the current inequality because assets are appreciating in value far more than people are raising their incomes. So if you own a house, you're doing very well. If you have a large pension 
jackpot, you're doing very well. If you have shares, you're doing very well. And that's the nettle that has to be grasped. Now to agree, to a degree my party is looking at property and we're looking at raising council tax bans at the top so that the Earl of Verulam must no longer pays the same as somebody living, say, in Salisbury Avenue, which is completely absurd. I think at some stage, and this is not party policy, because it's actually complicated, we have to grasp the nettle of inheritance. And I'm a bit of a sort of counter-culturalist um, on this, because actually I think inheritance tax, as it's currently conceived, <coughs> feels fundamentally wrong because we are double taxing people. People pay tax on their income and then their estate pays inheritance tax. And instinctively, I would like to see a world where the recipients of legacies pay the tax in the same way as you pay tax on income you earn. You pay tax on capital gains that you get. And there would need to be some kind of lifetime allowance. What that would mean, it would encourage people to spread wealth because if they left it all to one person, it would acquire, it would incur much more tax. If they spread it, it would uh, mean less tax. And it would start to tackle that issue of concentrations of wealth. But it's a very serious issue. The question is totally well made. And all the parties have got to face up to it. Thank you very much, Sandy. Uh, Kerry Pollard, what's the Labour Party's view on this? Um, inequality, and perhaps you'd like to talk about some of the issues regarding inheritance that uh, Sandy mentioned as well. Uh, there are three issues for me. The first is the a living wage, and we must uh, uh, pursue that actively and across the, the nation. The second is zero hours contracts. There's no place in a modern economy for zero hours contracts. We must get rid of that because it adds to basic insecurity. No question about that. And the third element is affordable housing. We actually spend 33 billion pounds every year on, on uh, housing benefit. And it seems to me absurd that we spend that amount of money and that uh, uh, affordable rents are now classed as being at 80% of market rents. That's nonsense, and that's why the uh, Housing Benefit Bill has soared. Um, if we had invested half of that money into affordable housing, bringing rents that people could genuinely afford, that is about 55% of market, which used to be uh, the, 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 the case, we never had it so good under uh, Harry Macmillan when he built more houses than anybody else. And that's to the Labour Party's shame that we didn't build uh, more, more houses. If it's affordable, that means that people have got the dignity of not having to go and ask for housing benefit. It reduces the housing benefit bill and it increases the investment. And investment is, is the key. Growing the economy, zero house contracts out, a living wage in. Thank you very much, Kerry. We'll pass the microphone over to Anne. Anne, uh, inequality, um, what's the Conservative Party's uh, policy? Um, well, obviously, depending on how you measure inequality, there's, there's lots of ways of measuring it. One of the measurements is the Gini coefficient, where actually it's looking at the different incomes between the highest and the lowest. And it's an absolute fact, if you look at the bottom two deciles of that, the people who are um, at the worst in terms of inequality are people who have no jobs, who have little qualifications, and little opportunity to move themselves higher up the level. I mean, they, they could have the ridiculous situation of making everybody at the top of the tree um, have a lot less and you, you've narrowed the inequality, but I don't think that's what anyone wants. What we want to do is move the lower half um, up. So therefore, I believe this government, in tackling uh, the deficit, which is what we've got to do, it's hard to invest in any good services and not mortgage the future without tackling the deficit. So we've actually now got 1.75 million people, more people in work. I think that's a good way. It shows that worklessness is one of the ways of perpetuating inequality. We've also got far more people in training and skills. It's a tribute to this government that we've got so many young people now on apprenticeships. In St Albans, the level of apprenticeships has gone up by 1,800, and that's in an area that's considered relatively affluent. Because if you are low skilled, if you are unemployed, your chances of moving yourself up without constantly having to rely on handouts, which I don't believe is what people want for their children. I don't believe families want to rely on handouts and also pensioners. It's a tribute to this government, again, which Sandy's part has been part of. Let's look at what we share as good values. The pensioners have had £800 extra real income put into their pocket. So I believe Ian Duncan Smith's policy of having one universal credit payment, which will then get rid of the raft of benefit systems and actually encourage people to get back in work. So more people are benefiting from being in work now than ever before. And as a result, the, the minimum wage now is 10,000 uh, 10, pounds before you have to pay any tax. And we're going to move that to 12 and a half 
thousand pounds. The more you earn, the more you keep in your pocket. And it's making the dignity of work and removing that cycle of worklessness. And don't let's forget, we are living on the backs of poor people in other countries and importing huge amounts of goods on unskilled workers. We want to skill up in this country, but we've also got to be mindful that we don't import poverty from elsewhere. And I'm sorry I'm going to disagree with Kerry on the zero hours contract. As a teacher who used to work zero hours contracts as part of the a bank of teachers that you get, supply teachers, your NHS and your schools would actually fall apart. When my husband died, I found it convenient to work as a supply teacher. What we've got to get rid of is the abuses within the, the uh, zero hours contracts, where some people don't know from one week to the next whether or not they've got a job. So we can't just say, throw out the baby with the bathwater. We do need people to have flexibility of employment. And the other thing we need to do is get rid of, and it's happening in St Albans, where people, young people are asked to do a trial shift, and they work all day for nothing. That is not a zero hours contract, that is just an abuse, a trial shift. And it happens in places like Wagamama's and Starbucks, and other places here in St Albans. So there are lots of things we can tackle about the unfairness of work. But I do believe this government has done a lot to move the poorest up. And I don't think just hitting the rich is necessarily going to bring the poorest up. We need to skill up, more training, more money in your pocket if you are in work, and find you a job and the dignity of work. And I believe this government has been doing that and turning the economy around so there is more money to support people who are genuinely finding it hard in life. Thank you very much. Just that leads on quite nicely into the next question, which is regarding uh, the debt, um, which has been something that's been part of the political narrative um, uh, almost continuously for the last uh, five years. So the question is, our debt is at an all-time high. How does your party balance the needs of society now versus mortgaging our children's future without the burden of falling, falling most heavily on the poorest? So I think most of the answers that we heard here, we heard about the needs of society now. Um, so how do we balance this with um, the requirement not to mortgage our children's future? Please, uh, if you answer that and then pass the microphone to Jack. Well, obviously, this, this government has only been in place for five years, but they inherited a situation where Liam Byrne left a note saying there is no money. And worse than that, the deficit was not <coughs> what it is now. So saying there is no money means basically we're broke. And we were broke with then increases all the time you put on to the debt. So the debt is growing because we are paying more in servicing a debt which is interest on what we've already spent. So our government, which again, Sandy the past has been part of, said unless we are going to mortgage the future, always think that somebody else is going to pay this off. We have to live within our means. And difficult choices will be made. As I said in my early 2005 manifesto, Difficult choices will have to be made. One of the things is getting people back into employment. We don't want to pay for people to be unemployed. Of course, that's not fair. But we have to say, students, I'm sorry, we're not going to necessarily give you free tuition or even cut it back to £6,000. Because do you know what? Likelihood is, is you will be in a position of earning money when you're older in a good, well-qualified job. Therefore, you will have to pay and invest in towards your own future. Why should I ask a person who's working age 17 in a shop to be paying higher levels of taxes than they need to to support someone who may end up being a doctor, a dentist, or highly qualified. These are tough choices, but I don't believe we should be saying to the people of the future, the young people of the future, you have to pay for the profitacy of now. And so we have to make cuts in services, we have to make cuts in spending, else that debt will keep going up. And I believe any politician that tells you otherwise whether it's perhaps giving somebody, as I said, a reduction in tuition fees or maybe the Green Party's universal payment to everyone, who is paying for this? That is the point. Jack, do you want to make one to answer that? The National Debt's at an all-time high. What's the Green Party's response to the <coughs> Well, as I said, you have a vision and you start from today. So I think the way forward with the debt really is to tax where uh, money can be raised, to tax uh, unproductive activity, so the, the transactions tax, for example, uh, the Tobin tax, whatever you'd like to, to call it, on speculative transactions, uh, small amounts of money on uh, facile trading for trading's sake uh, could accumulate zillions. We do uh, recognise the need for a wealth tax. 
Uh, in fact, Sandy's talk about the inheritance tax idea falling on the recipient is also Green Party policy. No single idea belongs to one party, there is a mix. We think that taxes should be raised on behaviours that are bad for the environment, for example. And those kinds of ways are how you raise your income levels. We are not uh, an irresponsible party. We wouldn't throw money at Trident. We wouldn't throw money at HS2. We wouldn't throw money to the French and the Chinese governments to build nuclear power stations for us. Thank you very much, Sandy. Do you want to answer this? The, the specific question is, I think, the debt and, and the party's challenge in that area. Uh, the um, Lib Dem mantra is uh, a stronger economy in a fairer society, but actually I sometimes think we should be saying a fairer economy in a stronger society. The two go together. Now there's nothing Christian or left-wing in piling up debt and leaving it to our children and grandchildren to pay. So I am absolutely convinced of the rightness of balancing the books. The question is how we get there and then what we do thereafter. And the coalition is split. We share a common objective of balancing the books, but Lib Dems are quite clear that should just be done on the backs of welfare and on the backs of the poor. And therefore we have to raise taxes as well. Raising taxes was the bit missing from Anne's answer to this question. And that means, for example, richer pensioners losing their perks, heating allowance and so on. It means tackling the scourge of tax evasion. I think all of us were shocked by what we read about HSBC and what it was doing. By the way, its chairman at the time was an ordained Anglican vicar, which is a bit startling, really. Lord Green is ordained as a clergyman, not full-time, but non stipendary It's interesting to think about the implications um, of that. And also, as Jack says, we have to look at where we're spending money. And my party certainly believes that like-for-like like replacement of Trident at £130 billion is A, in defence terms nonsense, but B, in financial terms nonsense. So rather than putting it all onto welfare cuts, we've got to look elsewhere. But it is quite clear that we do need to balance the books. But after that, because again, the conservative mantra, George Osborne's mantra, is to go on making government smaller, to go on making cuts, to start a budget surplus. Now, Lib Dem, to the party of beverage, instinctively believe there is a role for the state. We need to have a decent health service. We need to provide for the elderly um, in terms of social care. Um, we need to have education. And so our view is that once you balance the books, then you actually think about where you spend the money, not carry on just for the sake of it in ideological terms, cutting, cutting, cutting. Thank you, Sandy. Um, Kerry, the, the, the specific question is about the debt and uh, the uh, Labour Party's uh, position on, on that, and uh, you might want to respond to what Anne said as well about the um, previous government. Yeah, thank you. Um, a big portion of the debt was due to the bank's failure in 2008. £128 billion pounds was, uh, was, was, was ploughed into that. Now, I don't detect, I didn't detect at the time, any party, any individual member of parliament, any chancellor, uh, uh, any shadow chancellor suggesting that, uh, that the bank should have been rescued. So a portion of that, £128 billion pounds went into rescuing the banks. Uh, there's also a question of short-term borrowing and long-term borrowing for investment, and we're getting confused about that. Short-term borrowing is where we, we, we borrow for uh, benefits and, and, and pensions and stuff like that. Now, that's one uh, aspect. So we've got to get the benefit bill down. And I talked earlier about housing benefit, which I know a little bit about. £33 billion pounds spent uh, each year and rising. We could get that down by investing, borrowing long term over 30 years uh, to build affordable homes. You do that, after the 30 years are up, uh, you can uh, uh, borrow on that on the asset again and again and again. These will provide homes, decent homes for generations of people. Money. So we, we transfer from short-term borrowing to long-term borrowing for investment. That's the trick. And it was worked for donkey's years. I mentioned that uh, um, Matt Miller earlier on, who built 450,000 homes in, a, in a, each year. 
saying that this was an investment for the future and for our children and their children. And that's where we need to get back to. So prudent borrowing, prudent borrowing to invest in our infrastructure, housing particularly, but schools, hospitals, and, and so on. Getting the benefit bill down, getting other benefits down. I pray each day that there will be nobody needing benefit at all. Now that's utopian, but we can aim towards that, and that can be our ambition. Thank you, Kerry. Uh, why don't you just move us quite nicely on to the next one, so if you hang on to the microphone and let me read this question out. So the third question that we had submitted by email, all the candidates have seen these in, in advance, by the way, with the exception of two, which I will mention. So the third question is, um, our society has Christian roots, and much current voluntary work in society comes as a product of people's faith. Would your party be promoting the erosion of Christian values in society? And what is your personal position on the Christian faith? And how does Christianity influence your views? Uh, I'm almost unique, I think, in the, in the, when I was a member of Parliament, because I was a, a, a member of the uh, Parliamentary uh, Life Group. And I think that was, there was me and Jim Dobbin. Jim Dobbin's now dead. Uh, and so if I went back, or when I went back, I would be probably the only uh, Labour member as part of that. So that's, that's my stance. I'm pro-life, uh, practising Catholic, seven children, all the hallmarks of a good Christian family. That's me. <laughs> and I would want to continue uh, d doing that, promoting uh, Christian values. Uh, I have some difficulty with, with uh, my own uh, faith and, and birth control, so I think that it's nonsensical not to have birth control. So I have to confess that uh, every month when I go up, that, well not now, but years ago, that, that now I practice birth control from time to time. Not all the time, because I've got some children to prove that I didn't practice, <laughs> pra practice it all the time. And now 15 grandchildren. So um, what, what I say is this, that uh, in, in due course there will be more pollards in the telephone direction than Smith's. And that, if I can live long enough, I'll have an inbuilt majority. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Very good. Um, Sandy, do you, do you want to respond to that? So, uh, Kerry is at the bar quite high with seven children. Um, but the question, just to just remind you, was: uh, Would you be promoting the erosion of Christian values in society? And what are your own personal views on? on uh, sorry, how does Christianity influence your personal views? There are two parts to the question. Well, the answer to the first part is clearly no. Now, I belong to a party whose leader is a self-confessed atheist, but that's honest, at least, and not uh, one of these pretend Christians. Um, but the party, because of its long connection with the chapel in particular, it's got MPs who are lay preachers. It's always had a tradition of involvement in the church and liberalism is founded on the concept of respect for people's beliefs, whatever they may be. In terms of my personal position, um, apart from being slightly erratic at the end of my teens, I, between the ages of 18 and 20, I've been a regular churchgoer all my life. It's how I was brought up. It's how we brought up our children. Uh, my twin sister is cured at St. Paul's Kingston Hill in Southwark Diocese, a church which not only shares a dedication with this church, but actually would feel completely at home with the style of worship here. Um, my mother was Church of Scotland, my father C of E. I married a Catholic. I'm trying to make sure I've got sort of an end in each, you know, in each part. Um, and my wife will, be, will have been singing in her church choir this morning, as she always does every week. Um, in my own church, I've served on the parochial church council. I clean the church personally once a year. We have a rota, which is a very nice, quiet, peaceful, meditative thing to do. And I'm tall enough to get the dust off the organ loft, which nobody else quite manages. It's my one unique contribution. And I do the church magazine. And for me, all my life, really, the rhythm of the Christian year has been a very, very powerful part of my existence and I can't imagine living without it. It's just something about the way the cycle comes round, the different readings come round, the familiarity, the highs, the lows. Um, sometimes one thinks, when will Trinity ever end? But you know, it's, um, it, it, is, it is certainly an absolutely dominant part of my life because it's the way I was brought up, the way we brought up our children. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Uh, 
Andy. Uh, Jack, do you want to um, answer that next and we'll finish with that? Um, a very interesting question. I, I actually wondered if there was a typo when it said, would you promote the erosion of Christian values? 